I could have stayed in worship a little bit longer. I don't know about you. Are you fighting the battles? Are you putting the enemy under your feet? That was what I was thinking, and I was watching Tina as she was leading, and I know it was taking everything she had to keep from running around the sanctuary, and we can't do that with the camera because we can't keep an eye on her. But man, that's a powerful song. I have been looking at the comments and looking at the people who are joining us this morning, and I also just want to say welcome to you. I'm glad that you're here this morning. I want to introduce myself. My name is Lori Burchell. I am the interim lead pastor here at Christian Life Church. And uh, currently, our church is looking for a permanent lead pastor. We are taking applications, and uh, so please, please be in prayer with us about that. In the meantime, we're filling this role, and uh, God is, is taking care of us in that. I also want to say that you can follow along today on version. Now, you may have to, we're noticing version has got some little kinks to it, so you may have to go to the link. Now, I Maybe if you are on Facebook Live, they will post that link there for you so that you can click on it to open up you version to follow along in the notes. But a couple of weeks ago, actually three weeks ago, May 15th, we started a brand new series here at CLC called Won't You Be My Neighbor? We're talking about the fields being white as unto harvest. We also talked about loving our neighbor, that that commandment is equally important to loving the Lord our God. And so we are called to love our neighbor. We've been asking our church body, and I saw someone comment on our Facebook Live that it was 1020. At 1020 every day, our church body is praying Luke 10 2, that the Lord of the harvest would send workers into the field uh, and that uh, the, the fields are white unto harvest. We need workers to go into the field. When we started off this series, though, back on May or March 15th, this had been planned for several months. We were really excited about it. Our emphasis was on the neighborhood surrounding CLC. What can we do to minister to those who live around our church building? Maybe it's a, in a practical way, a service project, some way of blessing those in need. But definitely, spiritually, we want to minister to them. But about that time that we launched that series, coronavirus hit, the stay-at-home order happened, and everything changed. So we began to look and see what is our neighborhood. Our neighborhood now is more of a virtual neighborhood, and maybe you're an essential worker, maybe you are still out in public because of your job or, or whatever, but you're coming in contact with people every day. And so whether it's virtually on social media or if it's because you have to be out in public, you do, you are impacting other people. You're coming in contact with other people, and those are your neighbors. A couple of weeks ago, Steve McEwen, former pastor here at CLC, and I sat around the table, and we talked about what does it look like now to love our neighbor, and we talked about the fruits of the Spirit being evident in our lives, whether it's through a post, our commenting, our response, our reaction to things we see on social media, that all of that should be flavored with the fruit of the Spirit, that the character and nature of God be seen in us. And last week, Brady Mayer, he's the one service leading today, our uh, youth ministry director, he Uh, taught us how to share our own personal testimony and he encouraged us to do that and then we challenged and encouraged our church body tina talked about this while ago to go on social media and share your story of what has happened when you came into uh, contact or when you had an encounter with jesus christ for some it's your salvation story for others maybe it's been a healing testimony 
But we asked you to use the hashtag, my story, God's glory. And many of you have been doing that. And so I'm really excited to see those. I encourage those who haven't done that yet to please do it. Social media needs to be flooded with good news. And your testimony, your personal testimony is good news. So please take time today, whether you write it out or whether you video it, do that, post your testimony with my story, God's glory. And so today I get to continue the series of Won't You Be My Neighbor? with the emphasis of going back into the fields. The fields are wide unto harvest, going back into the fields to the people and sharing with them the gospel of Jesus Christ. We're going to have a word of prayer. I've got a tickle in my throat, so if I, I kind of cough, I, I apologize for that. I do have some water here. If you, were, if, if you were in attendance here in our sanctuary, we would have you stand and we would have prayer. So wherever you are right now, just please take time to bow your head or just at least uh, pray with us as we pray over this message this morning. God, you are so good. Lord, your presence has been so strong already in this place this morning, and we thank you, Father, for that. We pray that, Lord, that the words that we speak today, Father, will be impactful. They'll be challenging. And that, Lord, when we come away from this service today, that, Lord, our lives, our perspective has been changed, and we will begin to see the fields that are wide unto harvest, that we will begin to see that each person has a story. We thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen. I am going to cough here just a second. <coughs> it is allergies, I promise you that. <laughs> So, have you ever, when you have traveled, when you've left the location that you currently live in, have you ever wondered about the people in this place that you are now visiting? Have you wondered, you pass their house, and you wonder, who are those people? Uh, what do they do for a living? What is their fi family like? What is their family dynamic what is their normal routine? And, and maybe you've thought kind of, about, uh, kind of, how did they get to this particular place at this particular time? I, I know for me, I have traveled, it doesn't matter if I have been in the inner city, if I have been in the mountains, if I've been at the ocean, or I can be in the middle of a cornfield somewhere, in the middle of nowhere, and I come across a house many times when I see this, these homes, I will begin to wonder about the people who live there. What is their story? Is it because of, of hard work, determination, success, and, and uh, just having a dream that they now find themselves living in this particular place? Or, or maybe it's because of wrong choices, whether it's theirs or someone else's, that they find themselves at this time, at this place, living where they currently are. I guess for me, the reason why I've, I've kind of was thinking about this, about everyone having a story, because when you, you pass by a house, the people that live there have a story. Several weeks ago, probably a couple of months now, our church had the opportunity to serve at the um, Heron House of Hope here in Heron. For those who aren't familiar with that, that is a ministry of the Heron Ministerial Alliance in town, and it's a, a ministry to help serve warm meals every day to those in need, and plus they have other ministries that they do to the community. It's, it's wonderful. But each uh, week, a different church takes uh, on that that's their week to serve. And, and this particular week, we were there, and I was there on this one day, and I have served there many, many times. I've lost count how many times I have actually been able to serve there. And I always walk away blessed and so thankful that we were able to, to minister in a practical way to those in our community. But this one particular day, I was looking around the restaurant. It's a restaurant style uh, place that people come in and they're, they're served a meal with 
with uh, dignity and respect. And, and I, I guess I just stopped and I just took a moment and it was like all of a sudden blinders came off my eyes. And I looked around at the people sitting there and I wondered, what got them here at this time and at this place? What is their story? Now, not everyone who comes in there is in need. Some come because the food is amazing, and others come because they've built friendships there, and that's wonderful. But the vast majority of those who do come in have a need. And as I looked around, I wondered, what is their story? What brought them here at this time, at this moment, that they find themselves in this place? And I have not been able to get away from that thought process. So this morning, I'm going to tell you a story, a true story, and one that I hope that when I'm done, that we've had a change in our perspective and our thought process when we look at others. This story, it is a true story. I said that. It's not a once upon a time. But there was a woman who lived a long time ago her friends, or I should say lack of, uh, other people, let me put it that way, would not associate with her. She was not of the same socioeconomic class, and her religious beliefs and race caused her to be considered an outcast by many. And not only was she mistreated by outsiders, but she had been abused and mistreated, and maybe not abused, but mistreated by those who had sworn to love and to cherish her. This woman had been married multiple times. Now, now, I'm not saying she was perfect. I'm not saying that she had not done anything wrong, but somewhere something had happened to cause her to have gone through several different marriages. And, and at this point in her life, she was living with someone that she wasn't even married to. But hey, I'm not alone, right? You see, loneliness can make us justify decisions that deep down inside we know are not God-honoring and are not right. But hey, she wasn't alone. To say that her life had been hard is probably an understatement, but here she was at this time, at this moment, on this day, at this point of her story. And I'm sure that when she was a little girl, she never would have believed that she would be in this place. Because I can speak for little girls, many times we have big dreams of what we are going to be when we grow up. And to say that that's going to be our life was not in her plan. But that's where her life was. Now, many of you may recognize the story that I'm telling. Or maybe you're hearing it from a new perspective and, and it's taken you a little bit to grab hold. But if you're on you version right now, you'll see from, we're in John chapter 4 and we're talking about the Samaritan woman at the well. I'm not going to read this verse by verse. I'm basically going to paraphrase the story for you. But I want you, if you've got you version, to open that up and read all of those verses. Read this story, especially if you're not familiar with it, because it is, it's a really powerful story. This woman, the Samaritan woman, she was looked down upon by the Jewish people because they were a mixed race. The Samaritans were a mixed race and they were seen as impure. Now this was a long time ago, thousands of years ago, and at that time there was a strong prejudice against them. Jewish people had intermarried with those that God said don't intermarry with, and so they were looked down upon by the Jewish people. In fact, the Jewish people had such a prejudice against the Samaritans that when they were traveling, especially from uh, Judea that's in the south to Galilee in the north or vice versa, Samaria was right in between there. 
I wish I had a map that I could show you, but maybe you've got one in your, your Bible or you could Google it. You could see that when they were traveling, they were trying to get from Judea to Galilee or vice versa. Instead of going through Samaria, they would avoid Samaria at any cost. They would go around it to avoid those people because they looked down on them so much. But not only did she have her race against her and and her religion against her, she wasn't even accepted by her own people. Now, I've heard many preach about this woman, and they've called her a woman of ill repute because she was living in sin with someone that she wasn't married to. Now, we don't excuse that. We don't justify that. We don't say that that is right. But what we need to understand is this woman had had five marriages. Some of them may have ended in divorce, some of them by death. We don't know what ended her marriages. What we do know is that she was probably rejected, had a horrible sense of rejection. She also had a horrible grief of the loss of her marriage. No matter if it was through divorce or through death, you go through a deep grieving process either way. And she was in this place. She was wounded. And because of her multiple marriages and then living with someone she wasn't even married to, her own people didn't even accept, accept her. So you can imagine... She was greatly wounded. She was greatly hurt. And I'm sure there was so much anger that was attached to all of that. So she had distrust. I can't help but believe that she distrusted people. But not just people, probably men. <laughs> she distrusted men because she had been hurt so many times. But on this particular day, we're still in the story. <laughs> she arrives at the well about noon. She finds herself, she's going to the well to get water for her household. Now that we know her story, we can understand that she probably went there at that time of day because others weren't there. She, she couldn't handle the way they treated her, their harassment, or the way that they were mean to her. So she decided to go at a time that they wouldn't be there. The other women would go early morning and late in the afternoon, but she went at noontime. So it was either because of uh, she didn't want to be mistreated by others, or maybe Maybe there was an urgent need in her family at that time for water she finds herself headed to the well now imagine with me now scripture doesn't say this I'm not even going to say scripture says this but I can't help but have this or believe this as she's walking to that well that day I'm sure she came across 12 men 12 Jewish men walking towards her. They're heading into the village. And I'm sure that as she sees them, knowing how Jewish men, Jewish people, and then men in general have treated her, I can't help but believe that she probably put her head down, didn't make eye contact, and just, just I got to get where I'm going. Don't even look at them. And I'm sure these 12 Jewish men saw her coming, a Samaritan woman, Samaritan and a woman coming towards them. And I can't help but believe that they probably crossed to the other side of the street because of their prejudice against her. But anyway, whatever, they were on a mission. They were headed into the village to get food for the master. So they probably saw her, probably realized who she was, and they avoided her at any cost, but they had to get on about their business of getting into the village, of getting food for the master. So she comes to the well. She gets to Jacob's well, and there's a man sitting there. <laughs> a man, really? a Jewish man sitting there, and he asks her for a drink. And in my mind, I can't help but imagine, again, my imagination, 
that in her mind she's going, really? <laughs> Here's another man wanting something from me. How dare? Another man wanting something from me. Why? Why am I the one that they always want something from? John 4, verse 9. Maybe if you have you version, I have this in there. It says, the woman was surprised. For Jews refused to have anything to do with Samaritans. And she said to Jesus, you are a Jew and I'm a Samaritan woman. Why are you asking me for a drink? You can almost hear the tone in her voice when she's saying that. Just she's snarky. She's, she just, I can't believe you're asking me for a drink. And maybe she's thinking, are you going to hurt me too? Are you going to inflict pain on me just like everyone else has? And you can see with each thing that he says to her, I'm not going to go in and dissect their whole conversation that they have, but you can read in that scripture that everything he says to her, she begins to lash out and she begins to argue with him. Why? Because hurt people hurt people. <laughs> Think of it in this way. Have you ever seen a, a pet? Maybe you've had a pet. And the pet is, you're, you love that pet, and that pet loves you, and it's usually a, just a sweet animal, but something has happened, and, and the pet gets injured and is hurt and is struggling, and, and the human comes in trying to help, trying to heal the, the wounds or the injury, and this, this usually sweet pet lashes out at its owner. It bites, it growls, because it feels like it is protecting itself. It doesn't realize that the human is coming in trying to help it. All they know is I'm hurting and I don't need anyone else to hurt me. And the same can be true with people. <laughs> Someone who is hurting or wounded may react in a way that is hurtful or hateful maybe even distancing themselves from others. If I'm distant, you can't hurt me. If I build up a wall, you can't hurt me. I've been hurt too much, so I'm going to build up a wall here so that you can't hurt me anymore. The pain they are experiencing can cause them to think not saying it's reality, but in their mind, they think they are protecting themselves when in reality, what they are doing is they are not helping themselves. They're not getting the care that they need. What she didn't know, what the Samaritan woman didn't know was at this point in her story, <laughs> at this moment, in that place, her life is about to be totally changed <laughs> she didn't know that she didn't realize that she had just encountered Jesus <laughs> he's the one who knows our stories and still loves us Romans 5, 8 says, even while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Even when our story had us far from him, he gave the ultimate sacrifice of love by dying on the cross for our sins, which is what we're going to be celebrating next Sunday on Easter or Resurrection Sunday. She didn't know that she was encountering the one who knew her story and yet loved her. She didn't know she was encountering the one who came to heal the brokenhearted and to heal their wounds. Psalms 147.3 says that he came to heal the brokenhearted and to bind up or to bandage their wounds so that healing could come to them. She didn't know it. All she knew was that she was trying to protect herself. She, though, had just encountered Jesus <laughs> and her life would be changed forever after having contact with him you see Jesus doesn't leave us the same as he finds us 
He doesn't leave us the same. He radically changes and transforms our lives. <laughs> ah, I love the story. So through this encounter with the true Messiah, you'll see that in the story, with her Savior through this encounter with him. And you see that in John 4, 26. And because he took the time to enter her story, her life was radically changed and she couldn't help <laughs> but began to go and tell everyone. In fact, she says, if you read John 4, 29 through 30, and then also picking up verse 39, it says, come and see the one who told me everything I ever did. Could he possibly be the Messiah. So the people came streaming from the village to see him. And verse 39 says this, because she encountered him, because her life was radically changed, because he came into her story, it says many Samaritans from the village believed in Jesus because of this woman. <laughs> Her story impacted the village, their culture, their society, their community was changed because of the time Jesus took to enter her story and that she couldn't help but began to tell that story to others. On Thursday night, I met with our staff virtually <laughs> and we were talking about uh, our stories. I'm not even sure how we got there. We were talking about leadership and, and we got into this place of talking about our stories and how we can change a culture one person at a time. And I shared this with the staff. I said, many times we want our government to mandate change. And I said, don't get me wrong. <laughs> don't get me wrong. We vote for, we elect officials who are Christians, who adhere to biblical standards. But what we need to know is that government cannot mandate moral change in the hearts of man. Maybe they can enact laws that will stop things, and we need that to happen. But they cannot change the hearts of men. Only we can do that as we begin to go out one person at a time and telling them about Jesus. That is what changes a culture. That is what changes a society. Because we share about Jesus. We touch one, they touch another. And it's a ripple effect that continues. And that's exactly what the Samaritan woman did. She encountered Jesus and then she took it out. And a whole village was changed because of that. <laughs> but meanwhile, the disciples, do you remember them? They were on their, the 12 men on their way to the village to get food for the master. They're coming back. And they see Jesus talking to a Samaritan, which we've already talked about. But she was a woman. And in that culture and in that day, a rabbi would not speak publicly with a woman. And it says that the disciples are asking among themselves, what is he doing? How is he talking to her? Really? Are you serious? But in the New Living Translation, it says they didn't have the nerve to ask him what was going on. They were just like, okay. And about that time, Jesus finishes the, the conversation with this woman. She takes off running to the village and they walk up, and I can just, you know, my imagination is very vivid. I can see them kind of shrugging their shoulders, and they're like, okay, well, that's done. Um, hey, Jesus, we've got some food here. Are you ready to eat? And Jesus says this to them. This is verses 34 and 35. My nourishment comes from doing the will of God who sent me and from finishing his work you know the saying, four months between planting and harvest, but I say, wake up. Wake up and look around. The fields are already ripe 
for harvest. He is trying to remind the disciples, yes, you were on a journey. Yes, you were doing what needed to happen. We needed food. But you didn't take time when you saw this woman walking towards you to enter her story, to find out who she is and why she is coming for water at noon. You were too busy. You were too busy. And he said, look, (laughs) she is one of the harvests that I'm telling you about. If you would just take time to look and see, it is ripe as unto harvest. Many times we see evangelism as some planned event for the future. Well, our church is going to to go out and we're going to do, and you can fill in the blank, and we think that's us doing what we're supposed to do for evangelism. Or or maybe we say, I'm going to go to Africa. and And those are all good things. But what we need to realize is it's not in the distant future that we have the command to see people, to reach people. It's in our daily lives we have opportunities to minister to people. What about the store clerks in Walmart or Kroger or wherever you shop, Target? Have you taken time to find out about them? Or are we so busy about, I've got to get what I need to get, that we don't see people who may be hurting? We need to take time in our daily schedules, in our daily lives, to see people and to enter their stories. Here's another one. Let's not become so prejudiced against others, whether it's their race, their religion, their lack of religion, (laughs) their lifestyle, their socioeconomic class, or whatever, whatever thing that makes us become prejudiced, that we decide, I'm going to avoid these people at any cost. They're not like me. I don't want to know their story. I don't want to enter their world. And we, just like the Jewish people, decide to go the long way around when we see them coming towards us because we don't want to to minister to them or we don't want our hands dirty. Now, I don't know if you're saying ouch. (laughs) I've been saying ouch through this whole thing because it's stepping on my toes. How many times do we do that? We see individuals and because they're different than us, instead of seeing them as people that Jesus loves and that he died for and that they need him, we decide I'm gonna avoid them at any cost and we take the long way around to avoid them. Here's the third takeaway. When we are on social media, and see someone lash out, instead of entering the argument and trying to make a point, are we saying ouch yet? We need to step back and ask, is this person wounded? What is causing them to react like this or to respond like this? What is causing them to act this way? We can try to do something to bring healing to them. Just showing the love of Jesus. Just showing the love of Jesus. Or not even responding when inside we want to react and we want to argue. I don't think that Jesus ever called us to argue. I I don't think I've ever seen that in scripture. But we are supposed to show him to others. And we are supposed to love others with his love. So... We've been praying Luke 10, 2. I said this at the beginning of my message every day at 10, 20. And we have been praying that the Lord of the harvest would send workers into the field because they are white as unto harvest. But what we also need to begin praying is, Lord, send me. Open my eyes, God. Open my eyes. Help me to wake up. That's what Jesus said to his disciples. Wake up and look around. People are all around you who need Jesus. Are we willing to wake up and look around and see those people in our daily lives? Are we willing to step into their stories? 
Are we willing to find out about their stories of why they are here at this time and at this place? So this morning, we're going to have a word of prayer. And I want to, I, I want to pray for individuals First of all, I want to pray for all of us that we will wake up, (laughs) that we will become aware of people and maybe what they're going through. But I also want to pray for those who may be wounded and hurting. Maybe you're even lonely. Maybe you were lonely before the quarantine, but now it's even worse. Or, or maybe you're experiencing loneliness because of the quarantine. I want to pray for you today. That you will not justify some decisions that you would normally not make. Just because that loneliness is so real. I also want to pray for those who may have distanced themselves on purpose from others trying to protect yourself. And I pray (laughs) that today you encounter Jesus, you encounter him, (laughs) and that your life is totally changed because of him. If you have a prayer need, Please send us a private message if you don't want to put it there on the the stream there of the public comments. If you want to put those there, you can, but maybe you have a specific need. Please send us a private message. We want to pray for you, but right now, I'm going to pray. Lord, I just thank you, God, for your word. I thank you, Lord God, that you call us to the fields. And you say, don't say, look, four months and the the harvest will be ready. You say, look now, because people need you now. Open our eyes, God. Open our eyes to see. And Lord, as we're praying Luke 10 too, I pray that we will be just like Isaiah who said, send me. When God said, who shall I send? He said, send me. I pray that God, that becomes our heart cry. And Lord, I also pray for those who are wounded and hurting Maybe you started watching today and and your wounds and your hurt have been so great. Maybe you've experienced loss recently and there is such deep grieving going on in your heart. Whether the loss was through a death or maybe it was a loss of a a divorce, a loss of marriage, or maybe it's a loss of job, of your job, and you are grieving and you are hurting. Lord, I pray today that those who are wounded, those who are grieving, Father, will receive peace. And that, Lord, you will go in and you will heal the brokenhearted and you will bind up their wounds today. God, you can and you will. Lord, I pray for those who are struggling with loneliness, whether before all this started or because of this, it doesn't matter, but there's loneliness. I pray that, Lord, today, that they find you as that friend, that one who is there so close, as close as the mention of your name, the name of Jesus. I pray that, God, loneliness is dispelled and that, Father, they find you. They find you. Continue to give us love for our neighbor. Continue to give us love for those that, Father, maybe in the past we would have avoided because they're different than us. Place your love in us, God. Change us, God. Because, Lord, the fields, the fields are white. Fields are white. Our worship team is going to take us out. Thank you so much for for joining us today. I want to say uh, again, 
to remember the, the bald knob cross, the one for the cross, to give an offering for that. But also, if you are a CLC member and uh, you, you call this your church home, I want to remind you to please be faithful in your tithes and your offerings. We've given you different ways that you can give, and I encourage you to do that. So our team is going to take us out this morning, worship with us. If you're at home, stand up and worship with us. God bless you.